Uh, this room is full of uh, Feng Shui because um, I went to East Stanford Middle School where I was a member of the, uh, the Bonnakers football team, so I scored touchdowns on Herrick Playground. <laughs> um, I remember the very first song that I couldn't forget. I was at an LVIS fair in 1966, 67, and I heard from, uh, blaring from a convertible, the Beatles, Andrew Bird can sing. So I kind of, I feel rooted on Main Street musically because of that. Uh, first independent art film I ever saw at Guildhall, How I Loved the War, How I Won the War with John Lennon. Um, Helen knows the story very well next door at the Star um, was the paper that made me want to be a journalist. 1968, I read, read a story by Jack Graves, who's still on the staff, about a break-in at Truman Capote's house on Daniel's Lane in Sacapotic. And Jack wrote it so tongue-in-cheek, he made the, the robbers uh, sound like, you know, stooges, um, the gang that could have steal straight. Uh, and he actually, and we all know Jack has got this touch, he made it a very subtle parody of In Cold Blood, which had only come out in a novel in book form two years earlier. Uh, and it just sucked me in and made me want to read The Star. And from reading Jack and many other writers, um, um, I just felt like, uh, you know, wanting to write for a newspaper, write, wanting to write, be a community journalist, had to be my calling. So I, it's good to be here, you know, thanks for the start. The other reason uh, that it's good to be here is that I did a lot of research here for the book. A lot of microfilm, I killed my eyesight going over star microfilm from 67 to 73. And I did a, um, uh, some research on the Georgic Association in the Long Island uh, collection. So um, my uh, parents built a house on Whitney Lane in Waynescott. In 67 for $21,000 with land in the uh, Wesley Miller developed Westwoods. Mm -hmm. um, and the real estate agent who actually bought that house in 85 said it would go for $2 million today. So um, unfortunately, my dad sold the house without my mom's permission. <laughs> Quonset Hut, you had Austin Clark and his Long Island Automotive Museum, one of the best private collections of vintage vehicles in the world. And my favorite one was a 33 Pierce Silver Arrow mm -hmm. that was owned by Al Capone. And we could tell it was owned by Al Capone because it had bullet holes in the trunk. And when you're a 10 year old kid and you hear this story, you fall in love with uh, plastic cars like that. Um, in the uh, Watermill uh, was a penny candy shop run by um, June and Harvey Morris from 61 to 2005. And it was a great place. You could get any, every possible uh, kind of candy. But June and Harvey Morris were real citizens. Um, my favorite story involved some um, folks who would get off the bus late in Watermill and see the windmill across from the penny candy shop and think they were in East Hampton, because East Hampton has a windmill too. So there's no bus after 10 o'clock. So Harvey Morris would pick them up in his Jeep and drive them to East Hampton. So tell me, what other penny candy shop merchant is that good a citizen? Um, so I had to write the book partly because of people like that. They were very special in my childhood, besides dispensing the greatest candy. Um, in Bridgeham, Bridgehampton was where my baseball hero, Kari Stremski, grew up. He's a Red Sox um, hero uh, in the Hall of Fame. And there's a chapter in the book about the summer that uh, he had, a great summer in 67, uh, where he led the Red Sox to the World Series from out of the blue. 
And that was the summer that my dad and I, he brought my dad and myself closer together. My father actually built me a pitcher's mound in our backyard in Wainscott. Sand, dirt, and two bricks side by side for rubber. And that was the summer where I really went from my dad's shadow into his spotlight. And it was all because of Carmen Stremsky. Um, in Wayne Scott, all sorts of folks. Wayne Scott in the late 60s, early 70s had a one bedroom, a one room post office, a one room school where my sister Meg ended up. Um, it had an, a, a mansion owned by Estee Lauder. Um, it had a house on Sayers Path where we listened to Paul McCartney, who's brand new, separated from the Beatles play an impromptu concert. So once again, you're parked on your bikes across the path, and the next Beatle is behind a screened-in porch picking an acoustic guitar. Elliot Gould summered there in 1970. He had one of the most beautiful beaches around, um, potato fields, meadows. Um, it was just a wonderful place for not only kids, but everybody. Uh, I'd like to say that um, this book is not about um, a childhood of privilege. It's about a privileged childhood. Uh, these, all these amenities, the uh, beauties are open to everybody. So I just had to write about that, write about all these people and places who shaped me. I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from the book. Um, uh, one of the uh, chapters I wrote about is about the Hamptons Drive-In. Uh, which is where we saw a lot of wacky double bells. Uh, because in the summer, um, uh, the owners knew that any, everybody wanted to do things at night, so they wa would watch any sort of crap. Uh, so I remember watching um, the Beatles' Let It Be documentary film, along with it, it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. So I figured out years later, the only connection between those two films is that they're both set in uh, Europe. That's about <laughs> it. So, yeah. uh, there's a saying among Woodstockers that if you remember all the musicians who played the Three Day Festival, you either weren't there or you didn't do enough acid. The drive-in spawned a similar saying. If you remember all the films, you either weren't in the passion pit or you didn't get enough passion. Since I wasn't old enough to get enough, I can honestly, accurately say that many Bridgehampton teens spend so much time fooling around in the car, they miss a lot of fooling around on the screen. Uh, like so many drive-ins in the late 60s and early 70s, Bridgehampton showed plenty of skin. On one hand, the drive-ins owners wanted to cash in on the free love boom. On the other hand, they needed to compete against racier fare on cable television, a threat they addressed with signs proclaiming, Save Free TV. I love that. Uh, perhaps that's why cashiers let pre-adolescents like me see The Graduate, where a middle-aged, restless woman commits adultery with a restless, rootless young bachelor, an easy rider, where bikers use peyote as an aphrodisiac. My parents were agents of corruption, too. They took their kids to R-rated films because they knew we'd be bored to sleep, <laughs> which would uh, give them a um, relatively rare night off and still maintain family unity. Uh, that's why 2001 in Space Odyssey, which was originally released in 1968, was my surreal sleeping pill and hallucinogenic alarm clock in the summer of 69 when it was re-released to feed the frenzy of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And that's why I saw I Love You, Alice B. Toklas, a sex comedy about a bored middle-aged lawyer who clicks with a hippie chick uh, who bakes hash brownies, and who gave my proper stone baking English mother a burning desire to make chocolate pot. <laughs> so we still have this goal, right? Uh, tell me before I go, I'm going to make some hash brownies. <laughs> <laughs> or have someone make them for her. No, no, I'm going to make myself. So okay. sure it's enough to <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Another place that uh, doesn't exist anymore that I just had to write about was uh, the Bridgehampton Race Circuit, which was a wonderfully wicked racetrack, just 2.85 miles around dunes, very scenic. 
uh, if you stood on the bridge over the track, you got an incredible panoramic view of the steeples in Sank Harbor and Great Taconic Bay. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Is that what they like? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a great, it's a great golf course. Do you know what the um, fee is to get into the no, golf course? I thought I heard about five hundred thousand bucks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. That'd be an exaggeration. It's a gorgeous course, uh, but as a racetrack, I like it better. Yeah. A little narrow. Right. Welcome. Welcome. So I went there a number of times with my dad and some friends, and um, the world's best race car drivers were there. Mario Andretti, uh, Peter Revson, my guy, Mark Donahue, who really cleaned up at the bridge. He was one of the best racers there. I was there the day in 67 where Mario Andretti met Paul Newman. And Andretti did not know that Newman um, was sponsoring his car until he saw Paul Newman's name on the car. Um, and they became really good pals from that point on. And Andretti, who lives close to me in Pennsylvania, told me that he really thinks that Newman's affection for the bridge made him really a race car fan. And Newman raced at the bridge and became pretty, pretty good run, uh, run, run, racer. So the chapter on the bridge begins with um, me at that race where Andretti met Newman. And I began that I'm standing on the Chevron pedestrian bridge at the Bridge to Race Circuit, watching Heaven Duel Hell. It's a 1967 Chevron Grand Prix Can Am, and some of the world's fastest drivers are challenging one of the world's nastiest tracks. Dan Gurney, Jim Hall, and 28 others squeezed into fiberglass spaceships with big wheels and giant fenders, are whipping through wicked turns, shielded by dunes. Jack hammering around a bumpy hair, uh, bumpy hairpins, pushing gravity to the middle. Over 110 minutes and 200 miles, they turn the course into an obstacle course of sand, stones, smoke, flames, oil, and an unhinged door. A door actually came off during that race. Uh, I'm unhinged by the thundering noise, zigzagging cars, flashing metallic colors, burning fuel, sizzling heat and blindingly bright light. Even the peaceful horizon of steeples in Sag Harbor and sailboats on Great Pacific Bay is strangely dizzying. The bridge is shaking, but only because I am. Down in the crowd is a famous actor who knows my queasiness. Paul Newman, a champion racing fan, is in the pits because he's sponsoring Mario Andretti's electric violet Hunker Ford. Watching the crazy ballet of figure eights and fishtails reminds him of the harrowing ride the day before in a pace car driven by Andretti. Uh, and that was Newman's first spin with a professional driver, as well as his first spin around the bridge and the track. Uh, the roller coaster and the Shelby Cobra Mustang jarred Newman's vital organs and left him believing the Custer's last stand must have been a kiddie ride. And if you ever race that track, it was very, very wicked. But a great place and uh, a lot of fond memories, and I wish it were still around. I hate golf, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is a beautiful course, though. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So, uh, another character that had to make it into the book is uh, Truman Capote. He uh, had a summer house on Daniels Lane, um, uh, lived next door to his companion, Jack Dunphy. And uh, he was, I like to say, Truman Capote in this era was the Alec Baldwin of the Hamptons. You saw him everywhere. Guildhall and the Bridge Hampton Post Office and Bobby Vans. Um, that was a water hole in Bridge Hampton. Um, but I met him first uh, in 1967 at an auction in Watermill where he bid against my mom for a, um, uh, a painting. And that's how I begin this chapter. Uh, my parents are attending an auction in Watermill, hunting for cheap furnishings for the house they can almost afford. Mom is bidding on a small permitted painting of a young girl, something she loves but hardly needs. When she signals $300, this is 1967, that's a shitload. Um, Dad slumps and grimaces. He can't believe his normally frugal wife 
He's willing to waste a mortgage payment on a useless decoration. Mom is competing against the most extraordinary man. He has the squat build of a bulldog, the fey gestures of a matron in drag, the fashion sense of a peacock with spray-painted feathers. He wears a Panama hat, a floral short, short, shorts, long socks, and windshield-sized sunglasses. A pretty gaudy getup for a summer um, morning around among the uh, linen and khaki crowd. Uh, amusingly grotesque, he could be a um, friend of Uncle Fester, the Adams family, my favorite TV clan. Charmingly gnomish, he could be the uncle or the aunt of the girl in the picture. The strange looking stranger wins the painting at three, 325 bucks, then does something strange. He sashays over to mom, bows, and kisses her right hand. Madam, he says in a squeaky, lip-smacking voice, you are a most worthy adversary. <laughs> Truman Capote, after my mom. Truman Capote, famous writer, infamous celebrity, Sagaponic's most renowned resident, admires my mother's feistiness. She blushes at his courtly praise. It will take her a few days to realize she was way, way out of her league at the auction. She could never, ever have trumped the deep-pocketed author of Enco Blood, not in this lifetime, or the next, or the one after that. And um, Truman Capote was the first writer um, whose writing I fell in love with. Uh, have any of you read uh, Christmas Memory? Well, uh, it's a great story. I read it. It's a, you know, one of the co-stars is a seven-year-old boy down in Alabama. Um, who makes uh, fruitcake and has adventures with his uh, uh, mentally challenged 60-year-old cousin. And I was seven years old when I read this story for the first time. And it made me fall in love with language. It made me linger over words for the first time. And the relationship between this boy and his cousin was so deep, so moving, that um, it was the first piece of literature that made me think that you could move mountains with words, that you could really change people's feelings. You could make them put a book down and think about their relationships with their own loved ones. So I had read that and fallen in love with his, his writing. And then he comes to this auction, and he's a crazy looking dude, and he does something nice for my mom. So from that point on, the entire South Fork for me was like Capodeville. And um, I only met him a couple of times. But I followed his exploits everywhere, and the star kept up with him for the month. Yeah. There was one picture I remember, he was raising money for the Hampton Day School. He loved raising money for the Hampton Day School. And um, he looks like a normal person. He looks like from Planet Normal. He wasn't the, um, he wasn't this guy. <laughs> this guy looks like um, the um, mysterious, um, uh, mansion owner in the film Murder by Death. You know, he, he was really good at that. Yeah. So once again, uh, you know, this is a crazy ass memoir because I don't, I defy anybody to come up with another memoir where you have Kari Stremsky and Truman Capote back to back. Yeah, that's quite a double play combination. Yeah. And the, uh, the last uh, excerpt I'm going to read uh, in honor of uh, Helen and Star. And I cannot underestimate how powerful the Star was in my life, especially in my career. Um, does everybody know the story of Grey Gardens? Okay, good. Well, the Star wrote that story in 1971. And Jack Ray, who was still writing for the paper, um, broke the story. He was invited by East Hampton health inspectors to visit this um, really ramshackle mansion uh, owned uh, by Edie, Big Edie Beale, and her daughter, Little Edie Beale, who happened to be uh, related to uh, Jackie Bouvier Kennedy of Nassus, and that became a big, that's why it became a big story. So, um, let's see here. Okay, here we go. In October 1971, Jack Graves began his splashiest assignment 
That month, he accompanied health inspectors on a raid of, raid of Grey Gardens, a ramshackle mansion in Farrell Estate in one of East Hampton's plushest neighborhoods. During the, quote, unique house tour, unquote, he met Edith Boogie Beale, Big Edie, and her same named daughter, Little Edie, who lived with no running water, mound of trash, diseased cats, feline, fe feline feces, feces, and raccoons that crawled through holes in the roof. Parked in the jungle-like front yard of their once pristine property was a 1937 Cadillac, a shrine to the late Mr. Beale and his frequent driving companion, a Dalm Dalmatian named naturally spot. The Edies dubbed their decor Louisiana Bayou. Their neighbors uh, were neither impressed nor amused um, <laughs> by the swamp, by the sea. The Beals, they complained to the town patriarchs, were spoiling and soiling their hydrangea walls, golf course lawns, and rarefied airs. The Beals quickly became international icons, the Beatles of East Hampton. What made their story so juicy was that the Edies were the aunt and first cousin of Jack and Kennedy of Madison, widow of a president, and wife of a billionaire. What made their story so memorable was where the bittersweet Dickensian stand. He portrayed the Beals as Miss and Mrs. Havisham, relentlessly independent, ruthlessly articulate kin, quoting the crosshairs of class warfare. And this is a quote I love. East Hampton is such a mean place, little Evie told Grace. It's perfectly gorgeous on the surface, and underneath I don't think anybody's human. <laughs> so uh, that was a good story to follow, and another reason why I like reading the uh, star. So um, this book is basically a, a bunch of essays, a bunch of meditations on how a special place at a special time taught a kid how to be special. Every single major passion I got, rock and roll, driving movies, um, the beach, love of nature, sex, writing, um, interest in class division, every single passion I got in six years, the six years that we lived in Wainstock, and um, it just was a calling book, so I'm happy to get it out. I threw it up 22 years ago. Uh, I had to get off my, my newspaper that I worked for for 25 years. And once I left that in 2009, it was, you know, all, all systems out, all CNN. So please, ask me questions. On, uh, well, you might comment, Lillian Wayne what your view of Georgia Association was that, would you have known people there or were they kind of... Yeah, there's a chapter in the book about the Georgia Association. Association. The thing that it's a, it's an unusual portrait uh, because this was the time in the sixties and seventies where Georgia actually had a middle class core. There were a bunch of people uh, we know who had inherited their houses. They were not wealthy people. Their parents and grandparents had been wealthy. They had built the, the mansions in Georgia. We were associate members because my dad was a barbershop singer, and he his barbershop buddy was a great grandson of a founder of the Georgia. Association. So as a result, I got to play on softball, got to play tennis by the windmill, um, got to hang out and listen to Carlos Montoya pick his guitar because he, he lived there then. Um, rode my bike over the speed bumps that they put in because Carlos Montoya's son was racing his motorcycle and they didn't, couldn't have that in Georgia. So to me, it was not this place where you, know, you have 50 million dollar houses. Uh, and it, you could roam there, uh, and I still think it's one of the most beautiful areas around. There's something about being by the pond, by the ocean, with all the rambling, you know, uh, paths and all that. There's something about that area that makes it seem closer to the sky. It's like beauty is compressed. So what I want people to come away from this chapter is that there might have been a bubble in time. Georgia wasn't the colony, the settlement. And even back then, you know, the Osborne family, which settled uh, the, uh, Wayne Scott in the 1670s, uh, were still allowed to come in and out of Georgia. But there was great respect for the original settlers. Have you read Tab Friend's book? Yeah, I've heard about it. I, I, I need to he read. talks 
writes about uh, Wayne Sir, uh, well, George Cook principally uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s when he was visiting. What's the name of his book? That's a good question. Uh, it's, a, it's, meant, it's a biography. Um, it's like old money or good, good money. Okay. Family had several generations of one that owned the house in the George Association. Right. So yeah. um, you might enjoy it. I think so. Okay. Then, you know, um, a number of years ago, there was a documentary film that came out. It's called The, the Windmill. And it was done by a guy who uh, I think his family had a house in, in the settlement in Georgia. And he died before finishing it, but his wife is a photographer, uh, Susan Meissen's boss. And his name is, was Rogers. Um, finished it, so you know there is that, that interest. I've in that. Yeah. seen that. I, I guess it's just the second point that I think you've touched on. Uh, I've come out here on and off for probably the mid '70s, so it was right after your period. And I would say it's, it's still a very beautiful place, and there's so many aspects to it that. You know, you want to be out here. I would say the exclusionary side just continues. There's a divide between the public, the middle class, and, and the people it's with money cool. that you hint at, but I, I think it's gotten more pronounced. Definitely, it's true. Yeah. I, I, I want to tell you before you came, when I told you, the folks, this is uh, Mary Bennett Gay, and uh, we went to school together, class of 1972 at East Stanton Middle School. And uh, my folks built their house for $21,000 in Whitney Land in the West Coast of Lansing. And it would go for $2 million today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's the same house, just added a pool right. and some shrubs. <laughs> the, the, the book is, uh, you know, I know other people could quibble with me, but this is by dumb coincidence one of the last gasps for the middle class is era. Um, it changed quite a bit. Uh, the real estate with the farmers sold their property, the developers came in. Um, you know, the junk bond people came in the 80s, the film people came in the 80s. It was a mean Republican town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back then, uh, and, and Bayless uh, Green wrote a story about me in the book in the star last month. And he started the story off by saying, Jeff Damon has a question for you. <laughs> when was the last time you remember riding your bike with like, an SUV on your tail? But honest to God, I can tell you, I'm not lying when I'm telling you this, if I do not remember in Wainscott a car ever on my ass when I was riding my bike. And that is phenomenal. I don't get it. But it was this, this bubble of time where we could all roam across farmer's fields. We were free to roam across the estates in Georgia. Some of us uh, in the off-season even swam in the Georgia pools before they opened them up in the season. Um, do you remember the, um, um, the Nagel Mansion at the end of um, Beach Lane? It was this uh, incredible 1920s brick uh, Georgian mansion with four fireplaces at the end of Beach Lane in Wainscott. And it was owned by um, John Nagel, who um, was kind of a suspicious dude. He was married to a wealthy person with a fortune in soap. And um, Nagel um, uh, fell on bad times, and he hired some folks to torch the place. The other problem is that the erosion was so bad. Right. Yeah. He lost, he had 65 feet of backyard, and it eroded to about 9 feet. And the foundation still shows. It, it comes up, you know, during storms, the foundation, and the radiator pipes that it didn't show too. So um, he was caught. Stanton police, uh, so that he wanted to torch it for insurance. <clears throat> but before that all transpired, um, it was an abandoned house, and it had a nice uh, tennis court in the backyard. And we all played tennis on it, and it was like guerrilla tennis. My best friend Mike Raffle and I would play tennis, and Mike would bring his James Brown tape. So we played tennis to hot pants and uh, you know funky music. So. That's just you know, good stuff about freedom in general. Um, it was a remarkable time. I'm sure it was. <laughs>
Any other question? If I may interrupt, no, you can go off like a tangent here. I think part of the the the, the, the Hampton's down here should be called hedge bill. I am privet. amazed. The privet, privet hedge, hedge bill. Yeah. The, the hedges are fantastic. I see, it's almost as though there's a competition between people as to how ornate they can make these 20 feet hedges. Some of them are beautiful, they're slanted up, others have got design in them. It's amazing. Yeah. I don't remember these um, August, years ago. Well, our old neighborhood in the Westwoods, um, there are two or three houses that remain the same. Yeah. Uh, ours is one of them, luckily. All the houses have been changed, they've been added to ours, knocked down, and completely rebuilt. The, the thing, I keep on saying the difference, and Helen knows this very well, a huge difference between the era that I'm writing about and today is that even very wealthy people back then were lax. They came out here and they didn't need gardeners and they didn't need 40 foot tree right away and they really didn't need privacy. They're so zealous for privacy now. Um, if you drive Sayers Path in Wainscot, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, small plots that are now just have shoe, shoehorn mansions and insta estates, you know, the sod and all that. Um, so that's uh, the thing. It makes me a bit, a bit sad when I see that, and uncomfortable. But um, I still have great friends up here, um, and I have the book, and I, I thank my parents for either treating me to this time. I love telling folks who have never been to the South Fork about the South Fork. Uh, and tell them you've got to get out here because A, you're going to see incredible scenery, but you're going to meet a hell of a lot of incredible people too. Um, you know, some who are rooted here and some who have been here for a long time, but they really treasure the place and they work very hard to protect it. Um, and despite all the encroachment, you know, there's still incredible pristine areas. Um, I'm sad to see that the beach. Uh, you know, on Beach Lane Beach, and we used to have these dunes that we could roll down. Mm -hmm. They're gone. And besides, the goddamn least turns and uh, whatever those pipe, piping plotters yeah. were sacrificing our dunes to those guys. But come on, you know, give us a break. <laughs> I wonder if any tortoises. You used to have tortoise for races, didn't you, on the road? In Wainscott, uh, there was a road um, right around the corner from where Flo, Flo and uh, Richard Thacker had lived in Wainstown. Uh, it was we nicknamed the Turtle Road because on rainy days, the turtles came out from the woods. And uh, we all collected them and put them in you know, cardboard boxes. And the cardboard boxes eventually melted from the, the piss in the, you know, in the boxes. And all but that. you had to turn them the right way. Went from whence they came, you had to turn them back that way so they could go home. Well, well, we had a friend who told his kids that uh, his kids had to take the turtles back to the road and point them in the way that they had found them because this was something moral or ethical or something. Yeah. My late mother and I used to say in the 60s, I'm sure she wrote it, that the difference between Southampton and East Hampton was that in Southampton the houses had hedges around them. In East Hampton there were picked fences with roses. Yes, oh. yes, yes. yes. And the other major change, I think, for me anyway, is that uh, when I met people who were new here, and I was new here, they were interested in the local community. They were interested in finding out who was that fisherman named Stuart Corbell and what did he do. Right. And uh, in the 70s, they changed the politics by voting for people who say were whatever Republicans out and uh, electing Judith Cope. Uh, but that's changed so much. People that you see now in these large houses, I don't think know or care or who oh, about. Stewart is uh, legendary. Yeah. I mean, he's passed so much on to all Yeah, well, I'm thinking about the new people who come here to party, come here to social climb, come here to have landscape artists build them grassy monuments, you know, and they're not aware of what they care to know about, I think, the roots. 
Um, you remind me that uh, your friend Tom Paxton, I interviewed yeah. Tom Paxton for the book, and he and his wife Midge lived in East Hampton for <laughs> 30 years yeah. or so, and uh, he has very, very fond memories of it. But he told me two funny things uh, about that uh, it kind of testified to the changing nature of things. He and Midge were offered like $40,000 for a Japanese maple tree in their yard. <laughs> Yeah, 40,000. So they turned them down because they're very ethical people and I think they were more amused by this. So this is one guy who wanted to, you know, maybe helicopter in a tree and have an insta estate, <laughs> yeah. you know. So he also said that, uh, now he had made to move to Virginia to be closer to his daughter, but Tom jokes that they had moved really because um, their car, their class uh, visa permit, their class visa permit had expired that they could not park their car in a parking lot in East Hampton and get away with it because their car was too lonely. <laughs> they had to move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I used to volunteer at the, um, at the hospital here. In Southampton? In Southampton, uh, and, uh, and my mom, I'm very proud to say, she was one of the first people who opened the Southampton thrift shop house. It was, it was a lady who, who, who lived there, who worked there, who had lived here all her life. And in her garden, she had the most beautiful azalea. Mm. And somebody came by and offered her twenty thousand dollars for this azalea to dig it up and put it in his yard. So that's similar to what yeah. I know. Uh, just following the comments that made East Hampton and South Hampton, I think the I always learn early on when I came out here. 70s about the visual art history of the artists and that East Hampton really developed beyond uh, just being a farm community because of painters like Thomas Moran who was from Philadelphia oh, yeah. and who brought out uh, fellow artists. And I think that aspect of East Hampton has dwindled because the, no longer middle class can live as easily here the way they did uh, in prior years. And I think it's an aspect of East Hampton that you hope it can cling to uh, because it, you know, artists tend to be a little more free spirits and uh, not as impressed with themselves uh, the way some of you know, our citizens, <laughs> residents of the town are today. And so I think for East Hampton, that's been a little bit of a loss to, to lose the art, art community. I mean, we do have you know, record executives and, you know, I, I mean, I look at the artists, uh, writers, base softball game, mm -hmm. they really, no one's really an artist in the sense of visual <laughs> yeah. and no one's really a, a writer in the sense that they're writing books. They might be a publisher or they might uh, oh, oh, oh is it, has there been an editorial? <laughs> no, I, I just, but I think, you know, to me that makes East Hampton distinctive from other resort communities that has had this history of visual artists mm -hmm. thriving. Uh, What's in happened the now with the, the visual artist community is they're either just a step up from amateur, and there are lots and lots of them, or they're extremely successful, yeah. like Eric Fischel and April Cornet. Right. Right. So, but people you're talking about, maybe at the avant garde of the abstract expressionist movement before them, and I can, uh, I don't know who they are now, but they don't come here and they can't afford to. Well, that's afford. the thing. That would be my point. <laughs> <laughs> going, through, going through a microfilm of the start, <coughs> late 60s, early 70s, there are plenty. You did uh, in the highlights of uh, Lane Benson's gallery yeah. in Bridgeton. Those sort of folks were around all the time, and I, you know, we would meet them too. Um, it, that is a big shame. Uh, I, you know, there um, Edward Alvey has a nice foundation in Montauk mm -hmm. where uh, writers and uh, visual artists can get grants. It's a really nice deal. Uh, I think uh, Robert Wilson and Watermill, you know, does some more of the experimental stuff. But once again, like, uh, middle class, you know, living off the land, that, that class doesn't exist when it comes to visual arts. Um, back in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I live, I think sometimes uh, it's a better deal uh, for visual artists.
Hello, welcome. Hi, well, I'm sorry, Mr. That's a, <laughs> what, can I, what can I answer? What can I answer? <laughs> Have I started on every game? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. This is what the book looks like. Right, I know because I had the part for sure and I had intended to come back. That's what it said. What was this? That's okay. Actually, we're staying in Safe Harbor, so we like, we like Safe Harbor and Harbor Place. Yeah, yeah Safe Harbor hasn't changed too much. Well, well they actually have. They just hit me up on the screen. I actually bought a rack one and two of those things. Right. They have a committee now to say they said, oh, because they're having such building there. And they said it's going to turn into these tabs. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we don't want to say this. I said, oh my God. I said, I'll take I called my neighbor in Westchester and said, oh, do you want to get another rack off for you too? Yeah. Because they're having such things with condominiums and... In Chicago? Yeah, the biggest real estate news is the Bullock and Watch case factory, where no one's moved in yet, but they have sold out, as far as I know. And they have a waiting list. Oh my God. And the prices for the top floor, and I don't think, might, could it be fourth, fourth stories? I can't quite visualize how many stories it is. You're talking about millions upon millions. I think a studio there is something over this one million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. But they yeah. add, but the guy was saying, I knew this before, you know, when you go down the end of the street down on Main Street, there's a white building on the water that used to go temporary library, definitely a medical building. Well, now somebody's bidding and want to make a big condo there, too. Mm -hmm. well, so they said they hold these legal battles to try to stop this development. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sag Harbor was where I fell in love with whales. I became a male whale because of the whaling museum. Yeah. And um, uh, I also, uh, another chapter I wrote about in here is um, uh, Does everybody know the architect Norman uh, Jaffe? He did the East Nancy Senate. He did the garden, the, what is it, the gates of the world? Gates, gates of the world. Well, yeah. the gates. Yeah. That must be gates. So I'm going to pass this photo around. This one's again, this is a crazy ass memoir where I get to write about everything that shaped me from 1967 to 72. So this is a house I watched being built on Town Line Road in Wainscott in the summer of 69. Pass this around and see if you wouldn't fall in love or just be wondering about that house. I wonder though, isn't it something too that this period um, is kind of in which you write in which really, compared to today, there, there's been just such a switch in society uh, for, it's reflective of society um, as far as uh, the, the values and um, this, it's, One percent. Exactly. And it's, well, quite, it's quite different. I haven't, didn't have the uh, years to experience what my husband did for, um, well, this, this house is actually a pretty good indication that um, Norman Jaffe at this point uh, had maybe designed three houses out here. He eventually became a really well-known architect out here. So um, Harold Becker was a, um, a friend of his, um, a photographer and a documentary filmmaker, who uh, bought um, four acres of um, uh, you know, farm pasture land on Town Line Road in Wainscott and said, Harold, I want you to design me a weekend house, a summer house. I want it to be solid. I want it to reflect the land, be integrated. Uh, I don't want to have to worry too much about it. So Norman went on a um, trip to Great Britain with his son. And uh, Norman at this time was worried about having a heart attack and dying. So he had to get to Great Britain before he died. So when he's in Great Britain, he goes to Ireland and he sees this ruined Irish farmhouse with a big gable, and um, it's made of stone and all that. And that becomes the inspiration for that crazy ass <coughs> that uh, he designed with a saltbox roof, because, you know, saltboxes are mm -hmm. native to here, and a 30 foot high gable, and behind the gable was a huge chimney, a 7 foot high door, no windows on the side, it's all stone, and a wall that ran out from the house 50 feet long and 7 feet high, mostly stone. And behind the house was all sorts of windows overlooking the, uh, the, the ocean. Um, and it was just, you know, maybe cost 40,000 bucks back in 69. 
Uh, it became a landmark house, famous house, all sorts of magazines. Became the house that established Jaffe as a as a dude out there, and he went on to design incredible. You know, he called them pig out houses for uh, people who had more money than Brian. Uh, but Harold Becker became a famous film director. Taps, Sea of Love, City Hall, Malice with a guy named Alec Baldwin, mm -hmm. and he sold the house in the eighties, and he regrets selling it. But he sold it because. Um, he says the nouveau riche had invaded uh, Wayne Scott, and he said he had to get out because the locusts had arrived. So. But I still, it's, the house is behind the hedge. Mm -hmm. it it's not as dramatic anymore, mm -hmm. but it made me an architecture nut. And I started going around and looking at the um, whaling cottages in Sag Harbor, which are lovely, um, the potato barns that were turned into you know, um, studios and, and, and mm -hmm. homes, salt boxes. Um, so the East End has made me an architecture fiend. And, uh, today, even though a lot of these, you know, ten million dollar gamble roof jobs all look the same, um, is still you know, incredible architecture. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get people from New York Magazine or Vanity Fair to write about that stuff, unfortunately. But there's a, a lot to write about. I think the start does a good job on that. I'm a member of the East Hampton Architectural Review Board. Right. And uh, I think that what the paper has done is to be able to communicate the new architecture of today. That's not our greatest concern, though. It's not where we are today, it's where we're going to be tomorrow. And particularly on Montauk Highway and the changes that Wayne Scott's going to do now. When I was chair of the Wayne Scott CAC, I've dealt with a number of different uh, ethical changes to the street itself, the streetscape, which we're trying to improve very much so today. But there's so much evolution going on as to the type of stores that are catering to the community or to the village itself and being a gateway to East Hampton. We have a very difficult time to be able to preserve the history of East Hampton. We have some new signs coming which will introduce people. But we're trying to at least establish uh, some sense of propriety on the streetscape itself so that as you come to East Hampton, you're not seeing um, a major thoroughfare. And even today, with Plitt Ford now changing hands right. and, and a new structure that can be built there. With what Michael Davis has done on the corner, and, and to, uh, even to the Wayne Scott Shopping Center, which is Phil Young's property, you see how people are beginning to change. Uh, one of the things they're getting through is uh, having Christmas decorations starting in Wayne Scott. So, <laughs> actually, it was a very difficult thing to do, and I'm very pleased with that. But Wayne Scott itself needs to be recognized as the gate. And people need to be responsible. And that's what we're dealing with today, mm -hmm. more so than anything. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll flip it back. Uh, I've got some friends who uh, grew up in Southampton. And uh, when they told their uh, loved ones, friends, and family members that they planned to move to Waynescott, the Westwoods, in 1964 65, those people in Southampton looked like they had three heads. Why would you want to go to the boonies? That's the way you know, Southampton looked at Waynescott. It was pretty uh, rural and middle class, or, or just had a great variety of folks. Um, in our neighborhood, uh, we had uh, journalists, we had lawyers, we had accountants, we had uh, plumbers, electricians, farmers. Um, it's a, a nice place to grow up. And uh, we all think, and I know people talk about the golden chocolate, but uh, in November, you could be out in the Westwoods around right? Whitney Lane or Fox Crop or Sayers Path. And there were kids galore. And I still drive, driving around today, I don't see kids. You don't see them on Zayton Lane in the village either. I know. So I, I do miss that. A couple of weeks ago, that's the Kansas go up. You'll see them all day. Where, where's um, Dylan's? Dylan's Kansas. Okay. Oh, okay. I okay. went from Gerard Drive. It's a very, this is a, a Laura, 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 Laura. Although I know that the 
Ralph Lauren is kind of has a nice candy. I love it being in Wayne Scott. Yeah. It's just yeah. so refreshing to be there. I was curious yeah. whether you thought that communities in the North Fork might today be more the way you remember Wayne Scott. You don't know that. much about North Fork today, the North Fork. Yeah. I need to yeah, investigate that. Yeah. I, I don't tend to know a lot about it either, but it's just the times I've driven through. Say perhaps East Hampton looked like this 60, 70 years ago. Uh, yeah. And hey, they're, they're part of the world. Not even that long ago. Well, yeah. Not even that long ago. It, it was, I mean, I was born and raised here, so I mean, I remember back in the 60s what this looked like. There's, um, if any of you have a Facebook account, it is a site called Hometown Bond and Connected Friends. Did anybody ever hear about that? Yeah. It's all the people just reminiscing about Mrs. Epstein's store. Does anybody remember Mrs. Epstein's store? Somebody, Somebody started that. You know, it's just, and it brings back all these memories, things that you forget, you know, of what growing up here was like, skating on a town bond, and just, you know, Tony Cangelosi's and the Bombador, and Eddie's Luncheonette, and Sam's, all the places, you know, and the kids used to hang out. We used to hang out at Eric sure. Park. Yeah. That's where we used yeah. to go. Know. You know, and you don't see kids today. They're either inside on the computers, the iPods, the iPad, whatever. They don't play. Kids mm -hmm. don't play like we did. Yeah, I agree. That's part of the uh, early part of the book. Yeah, they just don't have any imaginations. My grandson is seven. We just went out to lunch. The whole time he's on. Oh. <laughs> seven years old. It's like a movie ago. You know, go out. I mean, we don't let him do that. You know, I mean, but it's like that's his generation now. Yep. So I don't like it that their friends is an orthopedist and he takes the family out to dinner. The cell phones in the middle of the table from yeah. the middle of the bench. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. absolutely. But they also never get to do anything on their own. Like I grew up in the Bronx, and I'm totally not athletic, but the boys played stickball every day. They went and made their own game. They made their own decisions. They picked their own captain. I know they're on TV. Um, and the kids now, I mean, is adult control. The coach tells you what to do. The coaches pick the team. Right. So they don't have a chance to decision. Really? Yeah. That's, that's sad. It, that's well, sad. they don't have a chance to be in charge or make decisions or fight their own fights because they, they don't have the ability to be independent thinkers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they get these things, and that really is right. a lie. I, I, yeah. I remember the candy, the candy, candy store in Watermill mm -hmm. oh, yeah. on our way home. Um, I give the kids 25 cents each. They fill up a bag of this, and this was keep them quiet for at least an hour. Then we had the same thing in the Bronx. We had a candy store, but now it's the same stuff that we bought as kids. I just took my grandkids to Dylan's, and two bags was fourteen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I had stopped them. I said, "Come back another time." But it was fourteen dollars for two bags, and I said, "Pick the stuff you can't get in CVS." <laughs> 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 at least that be something different. I just like the watching that. The wax, the wax bottles you've been on. Wax, yes. Yes. The, the wax lips, yeah. Mary uh, Jane. Uh, uh, June Morris. Uh, one of the things, one of the, there are many great things that have happened to me because of this book. Number one, Mary, and uh, our, our classmates have come back into my life. Uh, number two, my best friends, the raffles. This has preserved our Wainscot childhood. And there's nothing like saving your childhood on pages for not only you to read, but your kids, your grandkids, and strangers to read. Not only in the community, but outside the community. Uh, one of the other great things is that June Morris, who ran the Penny Cane Shop in Watermill from 61 to 2005, has become a good friend of mine. And she was in the hospital uh, for a leg infection a couple months ago. And another friend gave her the book. And she says that it got her the hell out of the hospital faster. <laughs> because she read the chapter, her chapter first, and then <laughs> went back. But um, uh, it simply tells her and other folks that she made a difference. She was an indispensable part of that community, you know, raising money for the, um, the, the sisters, the Dominican chapter in town, and um, uh, sewing, uh, you know, uh, uh, socks for soldiers, and 
and dispensing candy and making people happy. I like to say that uh, that place um, made adults feel like kids and kids like adults. And it was a magical place. Mm -hmm. And all the, all the girls that worked there had, had to be properly dressed. It was uh, Miss, Miss Morris' etiquette school. Never, you could never wear dungarees in that school. You always had to have dresses. You always had to be polite no matter how rude the customers were. Um, yeah. Write down. No cash register. You had to write down. You had to write down. You had to do your own uh, attraction. Uh, uh, yeah. So develop good uh, mental uh, mathematical skills. <laughs> so every community has a penny candy shop like that. In the Bronx or whatever. Um, one, one sad story is that uh, Harvey uh, June's um, uh, late husband and June were all set to celebrate their 40th anniversary of being candy merchants. And it happened to fall on uh, September 11th, 2001. And uh, they decided not to go to dinner in Montauk that night because it was just purposeful. So that's the story. Anything else? Uh, can I have yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. I am I'm selling these suckers uh, if you would like to get one. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh,